So, can everyone hear me? There we go. Well, fantastic to be with you here this morning. And um, yeah, as Greg said, it's a challenge. The reason why is that in Christ, there really is a massive benefit that we have from Him. However, if we don't sort out this one particular thing, which we will be talking about today, it's pretty much all in vain. And that's the problem. That's, that's why we can't get to the fun straight away. So I would like to open up for us just to read from Colossians chapter 1 verse 9. And we will go, we will go to uh, yeah, just a few verses from there. I like what the New King James Version I have here titles it. And the, these is, the, by the way, you know those little titles your Bible gives you. Those aren't actually scripture. So, but preeminence of Christ. I love that. Because Paul is writing into a society that has many different gods, many different philosophies, many different ways to success, many different ways to win at life. And he speaks of the preeminence of Christ. In other words, he says this, For this reason we also, since the day we heard, do not cease to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of His will. So we're filled with the knowledge of His will. And that is a prayer that is consuming Paul. Why? Why is Paul so concerned that these new believers who heard through another preacher, not him, would understand the will of God. Let's hold that question in our heads. He says that the will, that the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. So you're like, okay, that's interesting. Why is he talking about wisdom and spiritual understanding? Remember the culture of the day, remember the different philosophies, remember the different wisdoms, remember the different spiritual things happening. So he's drawing it all in under Christ. That you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing Him, being fruitful in every good work. Fruitful in every good work. I think so many of us today want fruitfulness. We want success. We want to benefit and help others. For me, being back in South Africa, I felt such a conflict. I, I see a a dispersed society with a massive Gini coefficient. And that is very different to the Europe and the UK and the US that I've been in in the last five and a half years. Where, on, honestly, it's, it's a lot closer. And people have a better standard of living. And then you, you see here and you just see people working all day, doing things which, in all honesty, I think, I think we're being silly about some of the stuff. Like, why remove the leaves from the street? if I'm honest with you. Like, why? Why take a precious person's life whom Christ created and give them that as their job? You, you must take the leaves off the street. Then it rains, and there's more leaves the next day. And you do that every day. They have so much more worth and value than that. So, Fruitful, so this is the conflict that I'm having while I'm here. I'm suffering momentary depression <laughs> while I like, look at this society and I think, Jesus, you can change this, but we need you because, man, this is not right. Yeah, I, in, in the UK, they just let this, the leaves lie on the street, by the way. <laughs> they just stay there, and they stay there for a long time until it becomes mulch, and then people, then it gets dangerous, and then they sweep it up because you can slip on it, you know. So at that point, they remove it because it becomes a danger. But anyway, so that we may be fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might. That word might is dunamis. Dunamis is power, miraculous power. So. Fruitful every work, we are strengthened with the miraculous power of God. This is really important because we're going to see in a moment how many in the church have been deceived. Many in the church do not walk in line with Christ. They actually walk in line with the world. And, and I'll highlight that so that it's easy for us to see. So we strengthened with His might according to glorious power. Why? For all patience and long-suffering with joy. 
It's interesting that we need the miraculous power of God to be a fruitful Christian so that we can be patient and joyful. Isn't that interesting? Because, you know, in the world and in the business world, you have power to act, to change, and to bring about change. You're given a station in a company so that you can administrate it properly and you can then bring change and get the job done. All right? God says, I'm giving you power so you can be fruitful, but also so you can be patient. I don't know how many of you feel your bosses are patient. (laughs) Like... You know, hey, we need to get those sales in this quarter. And you're like, okay, but it's not that easy. Or we really need to deliver this project. And the project has 16 hours a day of work, but like really the company's paying you for eight hours. So how does that reconcile? It, it doesn't. It's difficult. The world's not patient. Christ gives us divine power for patience because this is not about us working a system for success. And now we start to get to this two-part message. And honestly, we're going to look at something which robs the church worldwide of the promises and salvation of God. I'm not joking. I'm being serious. It's something so evil and cunning that even some of the most passionate Christians of our time, some of the big names that you see on TV, are preaching another gospel. Today, you fall into one or two spaces. You've either bought into the other gospel, in which case I hope that you will repent, or you are not in the other gospel, in which case I hope you get razor sharp and alert to reject the other gospel because it steals from you. At the end of the day, it actually robs you. So, I'm not sure how, how do we work this? We'll, oh, there we go. So, does your Christian walk look like this? And this is your emoji keyboard going from left to right, by the way. It goes happy, then it goes this kind of like really happy thing, then, then you're just a little bit happy, then it goes to sad, then it goes to all the sad faces. Literally, left to right, this is what it does. But it's a beautiful picture that these tech guys have created of most people's Christian walk. I found the answer to my problem in the Bible. Praise God for the revelation of His ways and His principles. I'm winning. God is good. Then, hmm, this has stopped working. It's not working well enough. How many of us have experienced that? Like, where's my breakthrough here, Jesus? Then, I'm getting beaten. Like, choose, choose one of those faces. Either the, I'm really crying a lot, I'm really upset. Then, Now I'm angry at the devil. Hmm? I'm getting beaten. Now I'm angry at the devil. It's all his fault. He's ruining my life. Now my mind is blown. New revelation comes. And I think to myself, how did I not see this before? It's almost embarrassing. Then we go through various different emotions. Maybe this will work. Maybe this time it'll work. No, it won't. Yes, it will. Okay, let's start to obey the book. And this ultimately describes a process that many Christians live and go through. That your Christian life is this continuous up and down, it's mountain tops and valleys, and that's not Christ. That's not what He bought for you. That's not what He designed. That's not our life. But it is what so many live. Why? Because of this evil. So, what has robbed the church? What has robbed the children of God of His provision? His promises, His protection, His healing hand. What is robbing us? What ensures that the promises of God will not work in your life? I'm conscious I'm preaching this from the opposite. (laughs) You know, instead of what will ensure the promises work in your life... What ensures the promises won't work in your life? Do you see how I'm trying to stir you up to be on your God? In every one of Paul's letters and the other apostles, they do the same thing. They write and they warn people of certain things. And in our society today, there is a very insidious thing that has come about. So what steals our joy and our peace? What is deceiving some of the elect? 
even those who have these hundreds and hundreds of thousands and millions of followers. What has made it impossible for Jesus' words in John chapter 14 that you will do greater works than him? Let's not put up our hands, but how many of us are doing greater works than Jesus? Because he said, assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me will do the works that I have been doing and even greater. This is a challenge, right? I don't think Jesus wrote it as a visionary statement. Something for us to reach for and never attain. That, that's definitely not the context of John 14. So what is it? Well, simply put, it's absolutely the spirit of the Antichrist. I know. And you're like, oh dear, this just got dark. <laughs> what is going on here? Craig, who's this boy you're letting in the pulpit? <laughs> but I don't want you to be robbed. I don't want what Christ bought for you to be stolen. And that's what the spirit of the Antichrist does. So we're going to expose it today. Good. And we'll see how far we get, but it's a two-part message. So if we don't get further enough today in this one, we'll just roll over to next week. Um, but we're going to look at how does the spirit of the Antichrist lure us away so we can resist the temptation? What is the spirit of the Antichrist? What are the symptoms of this ghastly evil? And what is the truth freshly proclaimed? Now, how does this evil lure us away? Quite simply, we're lured away by the desire for results. This, this, is, the, this is the conflict. We're desi the desire for results, the pursuit of knowledge or spiritual experiences for a better life, a better me. You see, when we start to engage in this thing that I can learn things to make myself better, we've just entered into the spirit of the Antichrist. Because unless a man is born again, he will not enter the kingdom of God. This is not about a better you. This is about a new you. A completely new you. This is not about I can take five principles and I can set goals and trust me, like I've worked in very senior positions in management consulting, I understand how to game the world system. But I'm telling you now, victory in Christ, the greater things that Jesus spoke of, are not attained by us applying and learning different principles to make a better me. No, the old me is dead. Yeah. Baptisms. What is that? A watery grave. Yeah. A symbol and a sign that you say, I am dead and buried, but I rise like the resurrection in the power of of God to live a new, different life empowered by the Spirit of God. Do you think you can attain that by having five steps to success? Do you think that you can attain the resurrection by simply adjusting a few things in your life, by thinking positive, or by manifesting your dominant thought? Mm -mm. No ways. If it was that easy, why would the Godhead have been crucified? <laughs> Why would God subject himself to pain when he lives in heaven where he doesn't have to experience any pain? Where he doesn't have to experience any hardship? How many of us choose to willingly subject ourselves to hardship and to pain? Very few. God willingly chose to subject himself to hardship and pain so that we might be free. Because this isn't just about teaching a few things. He had prophets. If this was about teaching a few things, he could have told the prophets and the prophets would have said it plainly. Yeah. If you want success, A, B, C, thanks for coming. Do this, we're all good. Book's done. But he didn't. He was crucified. 
And so we pursue a result at the expense of truth, Jesus Christ. Even, and this is where it gets tricky, even when we're reading the Bible. We read the Bible looking for a result. I'm telling you, that's error. Your finances are not going well, so you go and study the Scriptures because there's secret knowledge in the Bible which will help you to succeed financially. You will always end up at the wrong conclusion because the whole thing is about Jesus. The whole thing is about the plan of God bringing redemption for man. And yes, there are a number of things that God shared with people and we look at them and we're like, oh, okay, so I need to do this or I need to do that. But when you look at yourself in Christ, when you look at what you've received in Christ, when you look at the incomparable great power that is towards us who believed, the same power that He worked when He raised Christ from the dead, that same power is towards you as a Christian. When we read that the Father thinks good of us, praises us, and honestly fully supports us, how do principles, methods compare to that? They can't. But here's the problem. You can have God or you can have yourself as the Savior. You can't have both. So, the spirit of the Antichrist is actually an old religion called Gnosticism. And that's what in 1 John we see. So if you're wondering where the Bible references for this are, it's Ephesians, Galatians, Colossians, and 1 John. The whole thing. Like all those books. That's where this comes from. This is a lot of study for this to share with you this morning. But... 1 John is written against the spirit of the Antichrist, and he uses the word Antichrist, and he's actually writing to a society stuck in Gnosticism. Now, I don't want to teach Gnosticism because I don't think that's entirely necessary, but I'll give you a short snippet of what Gnosticism is. Gnosticism says that this world was created by God, but God estranged from God. But the one true God created various treasures or things to be discovered and as you go on your spiritual journey you will learn these call it revelation and as you have this revelation you will move closer and closer to God and uh, I think it's this slide actually where we're at this one here it says as we increase in knowledge and experience we move closer to God so in other words we have God on the one side which is the solution the blessing, the prosperity, the healing. And the other side is us. And the gap is closed by increasing knowledge and experience. Now some of us who are sharp will be like, yeah, but didn't the cross close the gap? Mm -hmm. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. But how many of us live a life where we are studying and reading? We feel if we have not read the latest book, we're missing out. Do you ever have that feeling like you hear someone talk about the latest book and you're like, oh, I've got to read that book? You know, Simon Siddick's The Why was one I recently heard about and I was like, ah, yeah, I really want to read that. But um, are you really missing out? Is there really knowledge that you can get that is going to make this all better? Or is it better to have God on your side? Like Paul said, if God is for us, who can be against us? So this is the interesting thing where we end up. We have Gnosticism, which puts us at a separation from God. We have the cross, which puts Christ in us, the hope of glory. Yeah. And if we pursue a life where we say knowledge and experience is how I get closer to God, and this is where Christians kind of struggle because it's so easy to go to the Bible and to say there are so many verses, there's so much to learn, I need to study, I need to apply myself. And, and I spend hours a day in the Bible, like I really do. I, but because I love seeing my Savior in the multifaceted nature that He is, not because I want to learn a new principle. Because you can approach the Bible and you can extract principles. And you can call it godly, but it's not. Because there's one principle, His name is Jesus. There's one way, it's Jesus. There's one life, it's Jesus. And the whole Bible is about Him. But we approach it with this mindset that there is something to be gained. I am missing something. And so when we approach the Word with this mindset of I'm missing something, we're then naturally looking for something 
that was never the author's original intention. The author's original intention, God Almighty, his intention of the word was that he might become flesh, dwell amongst us, be crucified, because he decided that plan A, before time began, was Christ. Because he knew that Adam would sin. It's not like Adam sinned and then God was like, we better think quick. What are we going to do? And Jesus, the word, puts his hand up and goes, I'll go die on a cross for them. And then the father's like, great plan, but how does that work? And the Holy Spirit's like, well, we will grant holiness for a sacrifice. So let's sacrifice Christ and then they can be holy. And we'll put lambs and institute. That's not the way God was rationalizing this. He, he said at the beginning of time, I am in all things, through all things, and by all things they will exist in me. I want to show people that. I want to make this obvious. And I want to have this gospel declared. And so at the start of the word, all the way through, we just see types, analogies, and shadows of Christ. Yeah. Now, if you look for a principle... When this is about Christ, can you find the truth? You can't. So, I will jump forward because I'm running behind. Let me share just a few bullet points. How is this Gnostic Antichrist spirit manifested in the seeking of knowledge? I must listen to the latest preach or read the new book, and my life will be better. I'll be changed. If I don't, I will miss out. Christianity is constant self-improvement. Like if you believe that, today I want to set you free. Christianity is not constant self-improvement. You, when you were born again, you were at the finish line. You won. Yeah. The best choice you ever made was Jesus. Yeah. And then you were resurrected to a new life where you share in the Godhead and His eternal wisdom and understanding and knowledge. And all His knowledge is available to you so that you can invent, you can change, you can really do amazing stuff. And, and that we will get to next week and in the business thing, how this powerful God manifests through us. But if, if we think Christianity is constant self-improvement, it's, it's an endless treadmill. You will be tired. You will be feeling guilty. You'll never be good enough. Yeah, it's tough. That's very, very tough. You find you're too busy being a Christian, managing your mind and your life, looking for God encounters that you can't be an effective witness. If I'm honest, and look, I do have an evangelistic bent to me, so this could be my lens, but if I'm honest, making disciples is the mission for us as Christians. When we got born again, our goals changed, and we no longer have a goal for finance and a goal for uh, family and a goal for this. We have one goal, to make disciples. That is our goal. That's what our Lord told us. Otherwise, He's not Lord. But he's called the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord because he's the king, because we obey him, because it's his kingdom, his mission, his goal, his plan. I submit to that. And that doesn't mean now that you can't watch sports on a Saturday. <laughs> because while watching sports, as we shared on Thursday night, you can make disciples. You can be speaking to other Christians and encouraging them because the days are evil. And there's a lot of voices out there which want to take people away from Christ. Yeah. So, again, if you have a defeated devil, but we are not there, wherever there is, and so our struggle is against ourselves. Do you ever feel that you're struggling against yourself? Do you ever feel that you're the limiting factor in your relationship with God? Then I'd like to say you're probably subject to the spirit of the Antichrist who is just messing up your Christianity. Because that's not what Jesus designed. He knew perfectly well what we were like when he died for us. The right thoughts and words attract and manifest our realities, good or bad. Be very careful of that. It's known, you know, the secret, the law of attraction. Honestly, that is not godly. It's not. It puts all the pressure on you. So here's, here's the thing. If Christ is a Savior and we stand and we are established because of Him, then what I do in my life and what I think can't shipwreck my life. Think about that. That's a challenge. But in today's society, we have really taken the, what's called the Great Awakening, if you look at history, 
when the Great Awakening very shortly is basically mankind discovered that actually you can make your own destiny. And it's true, you can. That's why it's called the Great Awakening. Everyone suddenly realized like, oh wow, this, this thing is not all predetermined. A actually, we have a choice in it. So our choice is Christ, which is why I say once you make the choice of Christ, after that, it's Christ who establishes you. That's, that's our choice, Christ establishing us. Um, if we're trying to establish ourselves, then that's Antichrist. Because either Christ can establish you or not. We tend, up, we tend to end up in arguments about God and the Bible. But, uh, let's be honest, we, <laughs> unless we're arguing, arguing about the legitimacy of the resurrection of Christ here, yeah, I'm not sure what we should argue about. But I've been there and I've repented because <laughs> oh, it's very Gnostic. Um, you can argue about a lot with the Word of God. Yeah. You know, it says women can't teach. Mm -hmm. You know, so mm, then why are women teaching? Now we're going to have an argument about this. <laughs> you know, say is, you, you know, you can, you can take it on marriage. You can take it on the way you raise your children. You can take it on business. Do not be unequally yoked. Okay, so in business that means you can never work with a heathen. If there are any heathens here, I say that in a tender, loving way. <laughs> so, you know, do, do you want to, so do you really want, do you think that's what the Bible's teaching? Or do you think Paul, when he said, do not be unequally yoked, was actually saying to a group of people who had come to know Christ, that at the end of the day, you need to protect your faith in Christ, and if you start to yoke yourself with philosophies, beliefs, people in an environment that's going to pull you away from Christ, that that's a bad thing. Yeah. That's what he's saying. And, they, and you know, we can go into women and teaching, and women should teach. It's beautiful. Yeah. Like, honestly, if, if you think that the anointing, <laughs> if you think that the anointing is based on gender, <laughs> we've missed the cross. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so women... Please teach, please rise up, and in fact, just do a better job than what a lot of men are doing, because <laughs> this thing needs help. <laughs> so again, if we must know all scriptures in case we're missing something. I have to know all scriptures in case I'm missing something important. You don't. The scripture actually repeats itself over and over and over. If we had time, I'd read you a, a summary of Galatians and Ephesians. And you just hear the same thing over and over and over and over and over. And, and that's the beautiful thing because it's Jesus. It's not a hard message. What about experiences? If the armor of God is spiritual elements, you know, you know I put on the, the helmet of salvation. I put on the, the breastplate of righteousness. Some people do this. That's Gnostic. That's not right. The, the, I, I do feel that it kind of sucks in English that we use the word wiles of the devil because most people don't know what a wile is. So what is a wile? A wile is a systematic, thought-out, logical plan that has been put together by the devil to defeat a Christian. So it's a systematic plan. It's not spiritual power. It's condemnation. It's, it's tempting you to sin, and then when you sin, condemns you. And says, you see, you call yourself a Christian, but you're a sinner. How can you be saved? How can Christ live in you when you're doing that? But he does. And you, that's where the armor of God is important. Because I am the righteousness of God. I'm saved. This is the truth. I have peace of God. You know, the shield of faith. I have faith that what he said is true over what I do. His truth is greater than my action. And... The sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. That, that is not a metaphorical sword. Yeah. That is a literal sword. The Word of God, Jesus Christ. So, overly important spiritual realm compared to the works of Christ. If you always feel like you're under demonic attack and that the spiritual realm is against you and you have to beat it and get on top of it and be superior to it, there's a problem. Because Christ's work was sufficient. If you need to shift the spiritual atmosphere so that breakthrough will come, there's a problem because Christ has already died. He already shifted the atmosphere. He tore the curtain and the Holy Spirit broke through the atmosphere, bringing us life. 
Intimacy with the Father in Christ. If I'm intimate with Christ and I'm intimate with God, intimate meaning, uh, well, let's be honest, it's an emotion. It really is. It's a perceived emotion and it's a perceived closeness. We, we think we're, we're separate and then if I'm intimate, I'm close. You can't get more intimate with someone than having sex, right? Like we're, we're kind of all adults here. Yeah. <laughs> and you, you can't. Well, Paul compares you and Christ to married people. Yeah. You're pretty intimate. You're pretty connected to him. So if the emotion isn't there, that's one thing. But that's just an emotion. Yeah. The truth is you are connected. I, I don't always feel like I'm connected to my wife, but the truth is I am. That's it, we're married. I don't always feel married. You know, when, when I'm in America and I'm all by myself and it's lonely and you've got a whole bunch of business people which you kind of know but you don't know and you're like, oh, okay, I feel lonely. I don't feel like I'm close to my family. I don't feel like I'm married. But I am. I'm married. I have a wonderful wife who loves me and cares for me and is praying for me. It's true. And we have a wonderful God who loves us and cares for us and the Spirit who intercedes for us. Same thing. So that's, that's why he does that comparison. If I could just get the right person to lay hands on me, I could get something I'm missing. <laughs> Other than one thing called the baptism of the Holy Spirit, that is not true. And even the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you can... You, you, depending, you can just baptize yourself if you want. Really. <laughs> like, so basically, I have a need for experiences with God because these change me. And these changes mean a changed life, results, fruit. That's the challenge. Success. Christian practices. I must pray in a certain way to have more favor or better experiences with God. If I could get answers, I could get answers if only I knew the right way to pray. Mm. I hum and chant like the monks of old, and I get into the same frequency as the Spirit. Now, I know that's an edge case, and there's not many of us here who do that. But I'm telling you now, for those of you who listen to Justin Abram, he says that. So just be careful. And there are others who do it. And for those of you who might have seen uh, that God Encounters video, and there was like lots of healing and stuff, and there was a guy named Jason Westerfield. Yeah, Jason Westerfield no longer serves Jesus. Yeah. Why? Because of Gnosticism. Yeah. 100%. You can look at his life, you can look at his teaching at the time when he was a Christian, and you could project it forward and go, you absolutely will be disconnected from Christ at some point in your life. Mm. So, don't, don't try to get in the frequency of the Spirit. You don't have to. The beautiful thing is the cross is the frequency of God, and you have the cross, and it made you a new creation. Yeah. You're already in the right frequency. If I can speak the right words and believe what I say comes to pass, then I can have the result. For those of you who are familiar with Mark 11:23, 23, I just quoted part of that scripture, yeah. which is very true. And either this week or next week, I'll deal with that. If I, repeat, if I repeat the scripture over and over, I will get what it promises me. How many of us have tried that? When I have a strong connection to God, things will be different. If I get a deeper revelation, then everything will change. If I can understand the spiritual laws of finance, I will prosper. If I can understand the spiritual laws of healing, I will get healed. Do you know there are people who actually teach that? That these are the spiritual laws of healing? And that uh, you just do this and you'll be healed? Um, there's a person called Jesus and he's the healer and it testifies to his deity to the fact that he's God that's that's the beautiful thing so we're, we're rounding out this whole thing we we didn't get to do that whole thing but let's look at this here and I'll say this when Jesus saved you you did not have to reach him but He has reached you and comes and lives in you and seats you in Himself in heavenly places. You have all the Godhead 
right now dwelling in you and you dwell in them. There is no separation and no distance. The circles overlap. The Godhead treats you like he treats himself. If only Christians could get hold of that. The Godhead treats you like he treats himself. That's why Jesus could say so confidently, ask anything in my name and it will be given to you. You just ask. Jesus didn't wait for you to fully understand nor have a great revelation and knowledge. He acted before you were born and authored salvation for your present life and for the life that is to come. And that was all before you believed. He came to live in you the moment you believed. Your believing came by hearing the gospel, which was a gift. The seed of the gospel started growing and will grow in you. The yeast of the kingdom is working in you and will work throughout your whole person. You only need to persevere. You don't need to learn new stuff. In fact, learning new stuff, watch out. You need to persevere with the gospel. I made a decision about seven years ago that I would stop all the principles that I had learned in business. I, I've read over 100 books on business. I've read The Secret. I've studied that. I've done different things on coaching. I made a decision, best decision of my life, seven years ago. I will stop all of it, and I will simply trust that what Jesus said is true. And I earn way more money now <laughs> than I did then. I get to have such a fun life now compared to then. I am not suicidal anymore like I was then. This thing will kill you. Performance my mentality to achieve for some of us means we will literally kill ourselves trying to win. Just be careful. Don't do it. As I said, I'm sharing this to warn us so that we may trust fully in the gospel. So our Lord Jesus Christ, our Lord Jesus Christ, he defeated the devil. He defeated sin. He defeated sickness. He defeated poverty. He defeated poverty. Anyone struggling with finance, I want to tell you, he defeated poverty. There is more than enough money in the world. There is no lack of money. Like being in the UK for the last five years has taught me if there's only one thing I learned, it was that there's more than enough money. There is way more money. And with God, you can figure out how to take that from the world. Okay, that's the business seminar. Now, we obey the law, we obey the Lord, obey His teaching at face value. We don't search for deeper and obscure and enlightened meanings. We build on the rock, which is Christ. We obey His message. You hear an act, this makes you wise and secure. So this is not an endless journey of learning. That's not Christianity. That's Gnostic Christianity. Gnosis meaning no, always learning. We're not always learning. Paul said those who are always learning and never coming to a knowledge of the truth, they, that, that is a cursed thing. He says having a form of godliness but denying its power. So, God is not out there. He is in here. He is with us. And He is our Father. And so if we need something, we just ask Him. And next week I'll get into the specifics of how we co-labor with the Holy Spirit to bear that fruit. But we can't go there while people believe that you need to do something to get the Holy Spirit, to hear the Holy Spirit, to earn the right to have his wisdom, to earn the right to have his power, whether you're earning it through experience or knowledge. We can't go there unless we are founded and certain that the cross was sufficient for all the supply of Christ for our lives. Everything comes to us because of the sufficiency of the cross. It was a perfect work, not lacking anything. And our victory is in the cross. Yeah. So next week, we'll jump onto that. Yeah. This was the tough one, the challenge. <laughs> I hope that made sense. Please guard your hearts against any false gospel. And much love.
and grace to you from our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.